Hello, readers and digital people, and welcome back to the Flat Cap Recap. I am your host, Grant Reeds, and this is my co-host, Friendly. And today we are going to be talking about something that has been popular since, well, since it came out, and that is Pokemon. And since it's such a special and epic topic, I, I thought we'd bring someone who has a little bit of knowledge about Pokemon, someone who has some theories about Pokemon. Welcoming in, Dobby. Right on. Uh, oh, shoot. Where to start? I, I have uh, a theories relating uh, to Lieutenant Surge, the Pokemon War, and uh, at all Nintendo games, Regeneration is just showing you the cycle of one planet. Just that, you know, gets away from Pokemon. That's interesting. <laughs> I'm kind of uh, out of those. I think it would be pretty interesting to get into the Pokemon War, because that's something I've kind of touched on before, and just see what your thoughts are on that. Every adult featured in the show, I like consistently. Ash's dad, Oga, Tenet Surge, um, the psychic gym leader, Sabrina, is definitely in it. So you think it's something ongoing? Uh, yeah, definitely. It's, it's like... Uh, it's like how the Cold War never really ended, but the Iron Curtain came down. There's still all this, like, levels of distrust and different factions working towards similar but not the same kind of, kinds of goals. Oh, you mean the evil teams? Uh, are they are they evil? I mean, MatPat makes a pretty good case for Giovanni being a good guy. You know, more going along the lines of doing the necessary evils in order to protect the universe as a whole but really the uh the true evils that are never really expanded upon are the corporations that make the technology that you use like Silphco. and much like corporations are heavily invested in real life wars Silphco is heavily invested in an ongoing pokemon war I mean, I know there's different version. the The company is called something different in each generation of the game, but it's always Silf. They're always just on the cusp of creating a brand new Master Ball. You can catch any Pokemon. Like the only reason you even make money in the game is to spend at Poke Centers to buy items produced by the technology worked on by Silfco. I don't like how all these things are connecting and how well they're connecting. <laughs> But, you know, it kind of got me thinking, too, um, when it comes to the Pokemon world and how it's all set and everything, you know, if you really think about it, the Pokemon League and gathering the badges and the training you do, it almost feels like a boot camp of sorts, doesn't it? Very much so. I can only think of two organizations that gave me badges for stuff I did. One was the military, the other were the Boy Scouts. And what are you doing in this one? You're preparing and training to fight. Yeah, Pokemon World War Two, baby. What do you think about that, friendly? <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> so you know, uninitiated here. Uh, I, I suppose the the most recent question to pop into my mind is, what exactly is the Shadow Pokemon? And keep in mind, I like, I'm not, I know you can name most Pokemon, and I'll at least have an idea of what they are. But my my experience is limited to Pogo, really. Um. <laughs> So, what actually are Shadow Pokemon? Easier explained if I go a little backwards. You know, Pokemon are born from eggs. Yes. Even though they, you know, mammals and, and reptiles and fish, all manner of species, but all have to be born from an egg. Most of those eggs came from a Pokemon called Mew. Okay. Mew is responsible directly for the birth of several of the initial legendaries in the universe. Oh. The, uh, the uh, legendary birds and beasts. Uh, that's why they have the primary elemental powers. And you created those Pokemon in, like, the spiritual opposite way that Mewtwo created Pokemon. And what's all, what's really interesting is Mewtwo seemed to be able to create his own Pokeballs. He'd throw them at trainers' Pokemon, capturing them, a thing you're not allowed to do. They don't definitely disprove that you can't, that you could. Every time I've tried to capture another trainer's Pokemon in battle, the trainer knocks the ball away. 
Oh. Now there are, there are different grades of ball that you know have percentages of like chance to catch. Like yeah, you're normal, you're great, you're master. Yeah, the the other trainers don't even want you to have the have the chance. They they don't want to risk losing that Pokemon. I imagine this is a similar way to how Team Rocket goes about stealing them. Mewtwo huh. seemed to create his own Pokeballs, throw them at trainers' Pokemon, capture them, and those. Balls, which function on a technology that disseminates matter into energy, hide um, an artificial environment inside the ball. It mimics the Pokemon's natural habitat. I imagine this time when Mewtwo threw his balls, when the matter was disseminated into the dark energy, he was able to clone and recreate them. There are already Pokemon cloning machines that you don't really get to use. The cloning machine was actually an accidental creation of Bill, the original programmer who created the storage system for your Pokemon. Uh, the first time we meet him, he's flied himself into a Nidoran, and he's talking at you, asking for help. Okay. He's also not sure. the only person to accidentally turn into a Pokemon either, but I'll get into that later. Okay, so does Mewtwo, like, kill them and just, like, take their DNA and make a dark copy? Takes an energy sample, and he takes control of the supposedly empty uh, Pokeball he created. You know, telekinetically, he can control many at a time. He uh, spits out the initial Pokemon, and then a second beam is the darker Pokemon. Well, the Mewtwo Shadow Pokemon, I absolutely agree. But there's also, uh, there's a couple different variations as well. Uh, there's the one from the uh, newer Pokemon movie, Detective Pikachu. They they had a different version of Shadow Pokemon, and it was taken from Mewtwo what? still. But what they did is they took Mewtwo's Rage from Mewtwo, because it was so powerful. Because of his psychic ability, he was actually able to project his Rage as a darkness energy source. So they captured that darkness energy source. They, they took it and they condensed it into a powder, and then they would infect the Pokemon with that powder of blowing in their face or having them eat it. So then they would have that Mewtwo darkness and hatred within them. And that's how they became Shadow Pokemon in the movie. Oh, that's nice. It's like meta Frankenstein all the way down. <laughs> you creates Pokemon influences and creates the generation of humans. And then those humans try to make their own Pokemon, and it's the absolute reverse of the one that made them. Mm-hmm. Ah, no matter the nerd fantasy society, people are awful. <laughs> Basically. What exactly was the, the Pokemon Wars? I mean, I, uh, I understand our baseline Pokemon War, you know, uh, between, like, humans and Pokemon, but I'm... Um, uh, actually, not between humans and Pokemon. Humans against humans using Pokemon. Imagine a, a trainer battle like a, a whole battlefield full of them. Attacking no one in particular, just chaos on the battlefield. Legions of, you know, bikers and bikers and Pokefans just chilling and having at each other. I'm I'm sure... When it was the actual Pokemon War, you didn't have the classes of trainers that you have now. You were probably hardened people, a lot like Lieutenant Surge. The character that also uh, establishes a canon continental United States in the Pokemon universe. Okay. If you talk to his gym trainers after beating them, they'll give you some info on the old lieutenant. In multiple games, a couple generations at least, he's an important character. A lot hinges on his journey. He was definitely in the Poke War. They pretty much tell his whole backstory. Those uh, te the teleport pad puzzles that you have to solve in his gym made those. The same teleport pads are in Sylph. They're also in Sabrina's gym. There's an invisible wall mechanic. Also used in a sylph uh, maze that you'll find in Koga's gym. All three of those people, Lieutenant Surge, Koga, Koga and Sabrina, had to have been in a unit together. They seem to want to keep a lot of the history of mankind and its 
intertwined nature with Pokemon secret. It's from the expository dialogue you hear in the anime that Professor Oak and all the subsequent professors know a heck of a lot more than they're letting on. So So it it sounds like there were a faction of people that really just didn't agree with people using Pokemon in the way they are, and after and during the war, there were some technologies developed that the the those that participated in the war have now incorporated into their gyms. Um, yes, uh, I, I, I guess the the point you guys were kind of making earlier, and to that point, was that it, it seemed like. The the game, as we know, like, quote unquote games, really feels like military training. Oh, oh, definitely. It's a dog fighting based economy. You lock eyes with another trainer. You have to fight, and if you lose, you have to give money to that trainer. That is the primary source of income. So, do you know the story of Gen Five at all, Dobby? After three, I pretty much fall right off. I'm bringing up that game because it kind of confirms your theory in a way. Um, Gen 5, the quote-unquote evil team, the entire plot that they have going on is that they want to liberate Pokemon from people. They think that it's evil for people to own Pokemon and use Pokemon in battles. So their mission is to stop you from becoming the champion by beating you and taking your Pokemon and setting them free. That was the whole plot. So it just makes me wonder, though, if that was what the war was over, because, I mean, that could just be remnants left over after... I mean, if the war has ended, or it's cooled down, that could be some leftover, um, you know, aggression and leftover ill feelings about the way Pokemon are treated. I think there's, like, a multitude of technologies that were developed initially by Silphco that are so powerful that they actually cause the universe to fracture. You know how you can't find some Pokemon in different versions of the game? If we're, if we're going original, uh, Red has a certain roster, Blue has a certain roster, and Yellow has a certain roster that crosses over in certain points, but kind of need a friend with the other games if you intend to actually catch them all. Mm-hmm. Genius from a you know marketing and programming standpoint. Take the slogan of your entire thing. Gotta catch them all! And you literally can't unless you buy all three games or, you know, you have two friends. Yeah. It's the same way now. All the way up to Sword and Shield. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. You got to create that scarcity. It also helps influence certain theories. It seems like the writers and programmers just kind of dove in and went with that. Something happens in each playthrough. Like it's it's a very narcissistic storyline when you play that RPG. Your goal is to become Pokemon champion, beat the Elite Four, catch them all, and no real closure. It it like all right, you're you're champion of the world. Oh, they usually give you some like after game tasks. Is it ever stated why they want you to catch them all? No. Except for Pokedex reasons, the the professors want you to catalog them all for some reason. It seems each Pokedex is only a research tool that relays its information back to a larger server. Because in-game, and even in anime, you can't use it to look up a Pokemon you've never seen. It kind of reminds me of the way that park rangers function. Especially with trail cams and uh, keeping track of, you know, which dropping their antlers this year and blah 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 it's just kind of like wild animal tracking oh you see your first pidgey the pokedex never lets you know again behind the screen in the pokedex every time you're within proximity of another pidgey send in a ping back to that main server letting you know oh there's lots of pidgey in this area so it's almost like you're you're basically doing or at least in the games you're doing what you're doing in real life with pokemon go you are taking geolocations of where certain things are as you catch them. Because that's what you do in Pokemon Go. You geolocate where there's a nest here, and you report it to the main server thing. And like when you scan Pokestops, it says, I am here. And then you catch something so they know it's there. So that's kind of a hint, I feel like, 
So that's what they're actually doing. Yeah, know? they they want to know where these Pokemon are. They want to know what they're looking like, what their what their habits are, how they're affecting the environment. Most notably, when you come across a legendary or a one of a kind Pokemon, like how they showed a second gen legendary in the very first episode of the anime, which was only supposed to be showing you the initial 151. The legend that in- inspired Ho Oh, yeah, is a, it's a it's a really beautiful one, and you know obviously all Pokemon are inspired by some real life thing. E- even the maps in the games are inspired by real life areas. So you and I, you and I talked a little bit the other day, Dobby. I don't know if it, it's a personal theory that you had that you were talking about the different um, elements of Pokemon and what like they represent. Um, I don't know if that's something you want to talk about a little bit, but oh, I just had a, a strange, probably insane mini theory that if what you were talking about is accurate and this is, each game is a different universe. Each game is a different timeline in a different okay. universe. Uh, like each each game cartridge itself is a pocket universe. Color is the timeline. Basically. Okay. For the generation, okay. and the generations themselves are the different universes. Okay. They're all, like, it's a multiverse. It's all world together. That, that, that actually, that, that works, and I, I think it might, I, I might be riffing off of your theory a little bit, but okay. Beginning of time, there was an original Pokemon that basically created everything. The Great Egg, I call them. Okay. When that hatched, I guess, um, you ended up with the, this huge arrangement of everything. I see it as a big bang, what honestly. It, okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's more or less what I'm picturing. Kind of working backwards here. You've told me so far that there's teleportation devices. You've told me that there's dark and light Pokemon and what kind of those differences are. And then you've pointed to a multiverse, and you've also mentioned there's a group of people, beings, we're not sure, that are trying to recreate different Pokemon. And it almost sounds to me like somebody has a grandmaster plan to find all of the elements from all of the multiverse pieces and put them together to recreate the original Pokemon. Indeed. And personally, I think that that quote-unquote person is a Pokemon themselves. Because everyone else seems to be a part of the strategic division of labor. Every single cell sealed off, working on its thing, never knowing what the the whole project is going to be. They can't even see the full scope. Like, I'm going to make multiple references to the fly. It's the same thing you know, Brendel is doing. He he would send out for a, a laser this, a titanium pin for that, and no one would know exactly what it was they were supposed to be working on when it was all put together. <laughs> but like Brendel would be this ultimate Pokemon hive, like hive mind working on something, something deep and dark they they haven't touched on yet, because. While they do have Pokemon God, don't have a universe Pokemon. Well, let's see what you think about this. I'm not sure if this is a retcon or if this is just them expanding the lore and we just didn't pay attention. But in Gen 7, in the Alola region, there's a legendary after the game that they didn't make a big deal about at all. But if you read its Pokedex, it absorbs light and then it expels it. And it says when it expels that light, it creates a universe. And then in Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, you actually, that Pokemon is the main Pokemon, and you absorb either the Sun or the Moon Legendary and fill it with light, and it becomes a light dragon. So could this be the universe Pokemon? Maybe. Maybe. Or we're just getting closer to it. I I assume you mean the uh, lion-looking thing and the bat-looking thing. Yeah, Solgaleo and Lunala. And uh, the the Legendary I'm talking about is called Necrozma. I don't think it's a retcon, though. In every storyline, 
past the point where we beat the Elite Four and beat the brakes off the game, the story continues unseen, and something happens to break it. And again, each game splitting off into in multiple directions. One prime timeline. In Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, the villains are Team Rainbow Rocket, and they're going through wormholes, collecting the other evil teams, and just going through and kind of collecting things. That makes me wonder, blasting off the speed of light. Was their original goal to maybe obtain Necrozma and do something there? They do say blasting off the speed of light. It is the light-eating Pokemon, but it's also the birth of light Pokemon. That just that seems really interesting. And Rainbow Rocket as well, like it's assimilating things. It's almost like they're hinting at it again. Kind of circling back from the end of the universe and the creation of the universe back to the Pokemon War. You know, now that I hear all of these different aspects, I think... Well, here's what I thought originally, that maybe it was a uh, split between Sylph taking over everything and trying to get away from that. Uh, the freedom of Pokemon, their liberation, or holding back information. But I think it actually is a little bit closer to the holding back of information. But I don't quite think it's just holding back information. I think that someone was trying to form this original universe creation energy Pokemon. And that either they thought it would be too dangerous to have that in our universe, like it would just blow the universe away or something, or... So it would be a bit of a basilisk. Right. So th there was probably a second party that's like, no, we don't... Th nature's the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to be... Kind of like in Umami, how Umami ended. We don't need to be collecting pieces of nature to make this godlike being when it's supposed to exist separately as its own thing. So it was nature versus curiosity, I feel like. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's just, oh, it's the eternal story. It's just watching it play out in Pokemon. I, I'm so attached to this series because I was lucky enough to, you know, have come into my consciousness and once at the same time that it hit America like a ton of bricks. And I've just been... I fell in love at first playthrough, and I've been watching my entire life as it's just been growing and growing. And it never, ever gets boring. It's so much deeper than most people realize, because most people, they see this kid's game where you collect monsters, and they're like, well, they're cute, but I don't understand why they're so popular with everyone. And then you actually get into the games, and then you see this, and you're like, okay, I, I finally get it. <laughs> yes, it, it is so, so much better. When when you can understand why you really like things, the philosophy and the stories and reference points behind them, it, it just becomes obvious why Pokemon was, yes, it, it had to be this. It was only ever going to be this. What do you think about the war from 3,000 years ago from, uh, I don't know if you know about it or not, but it's from the X and Y generation? No, and this one specifically, it was people and Pokemon, and they were fighting over this machine, and this machine was either going to end all life or create all life. It, it, I, they didn't really explain what the machine did, but it was over this machine. And the machine actually does fire during the game, and that's what started Mega Evolution. It caused Pokemon to start evolving further as they were ex exposed to what most people call infinity energy. So I wonder oh if that machine God. was the mechanical replication of this creation being. Create items to allow humans to emulate the power of any Pokemon. I think... That they find people who can do this, they collect them, they make them work on projects. The blackmail. The very first time we see Lieutenant Surge in the anime, he's a member of Team Rocket stealing Pokemon on the SSN. Oh. It's the same way in the manga, too. Huh. Deep, dark stuff went on in that Pokemon War. It's either so shameful or so bad, or so affects the entirety of the world, these men are willing to do whatever it takes to keep it under wraps. All the, all the force fields you run into in the game, all, all, the, all the neat little devices, it, it's, it's all in an attempt to try to harness powers into these Pokemon. Rather than have to go out and get these Pokemon, you just, you know, you, you pick up the Thunderbolt gun. Maybe these TMs, they obviously analyze the Pokemon and their DNA whenever they're disseminated into that electrical energy, that light that goes into the Pokeball. Every time you catch them, it, you're just, it's like Big Brother, man. You, you, you type something into your Twitter and the NSA's got it five minutes later. I think it's a little bit worse than that, honestly. I think, what I'm starting to think now is that this war was actually fought 
over the fact that every living being was digitized and brought into a digital world. That's why you can just use straight disks on things. That's why unknown resembles code. I think they created like a matrix type second world for some reason. Maybe the war was so bad it destroyed the rest of the earth and they had to put all living beings into the secondary virtual world. But I think that's what they were trying to hide. I really do. That could also be true. I just think the inclusion of the time machine, the Poké Centers in the second gen on, kind of lends more to a... Earth has been scorched, got restarted over and over again. I don't know. It's hard to tell. I mean, it could just, that could be the great delusion of it, or or it could be that this was the only way to save the rest of the world because it was so scorched, it couldn't be restarted, so they restarted it virtually, but found a way to digitize living beings. Because we know they can digitize, because the Pokeballs digitize living beings as it is. I'm just wondering if that, like, digitization isn't happening in effect when we turn on the console. I- imagine holding your Game Boy. You got you got your Game Boy cartridge plugged in there. You flip that on. Imagine the second you flipped it on, that's the moment you are digitized or in the game. Only have your perspective in there. Anyway. Everything seems to come back in some way to this first war, which it doesn't seem like we're sure is what it was really thought about at all outside no. of the existence of this machine in some way, shape, or form. And uh, what if... Uh, have either of you read the book Ender's Game or seen the movies? You have a group of kids that are ostensibly in military training. They are taken away at a very young age to train to be cadets in a a war with an alien civilization that has been just wiping out humanity's colonies across the universe. And the whole thing is them, they're in simulations, and they're basically being trained to be the next generation leaders of Earth's fighting forces, with just the highest level of strategy possible and teamwork and cohesion. At the end of the movie, the big reveal is they were actually commanding the forces themselves, the real forces, and actually really fighting the battle themselves the whole time. What if we're the cadets? And we are using the Pokemon to fight this war that's still ongoing. Oh, wow. We just think, ha-ha, it's a simulation. I like that. I'd rather uh, assume that that each timeline, at least if it's like Plato's cave and these are just shadows, that the real versions exist somewhere and the story continues on. But we don't know what the Poker War was over. Do you have some hints as to where it took place? Vast deserts? The large spanses of unoccupied land? But the war wasn't that long ago, and... Everything's still damaged. That's where it gets weird, too. Do you know the story of AZ? I don't think he played that gen. It's also in the X and Y generation. He is a man who fought in the war from 3,000 years ago. And he just, because he was exposed to that energy, he never aged. He's a 3,000-year-old man. And he won't tell you any details about the war. But he does say that the war ended when he tried to sacrifice himself for his Pokemon. 2,000-year-old man who ended the war by trying to die. Yes, but he never can die now. So I'm not sure how that plays into things. But, I mean, there could have been a rehash of that war. The war we're actually talking about could be something that happened more recently. And this 3,000-year-old war is something completely different. It could easily be something different. Maybe this is the war between the Groudon supporters and the uh, Kyogre supporters. And it ended when... Yeah, the, the, the rise yeah. of the cults. Maybe part of that war was maybe Pokemon and humans should be separate. And then it's like, but they can love each other and be partners in this. So that's kind yeah. of what made him turn against that war. And it's a Team Aqua and Team Magma in the uh, opposing games. And then an Emerald, you get them both. Because Emerald's the prime. Kind of going off of that, uh, the evil team in uh, X and Y is called Team Flare. Not sure how that could tie in, except fire, light, it's still kind of relating to everything in a way, I would say. 
interesting. All three of us with a different thing. Grant with fire, Dobby with signal, me sitting here thinking solar. Interesting you say solar, because now we've got Necrozma absorbing the sun or the moon for the light to create the universe again. And then we've also got the cannon, which had the light energy in it that made him immortal. Maybe it's just been a battle over light this whole time. Who controls the light? If mm-hmm. Pokemon should, or if people should, or if anyone should. First I thought it was there was kind of like this flow on off the ho What if ho isn't emanating light? What if it makes areas brighter by absorbing the darkness? Single-stage Pokemon are, in, are incredibly interesting to me when considering the, the creation theory. The only reason I can think is that they need to be constant. Whatever their their purpose is, the reason for that Pokemon's existence, the land wasn't there before Groudon, the seas weren't there before Kyogre, language wasn't there before Unknown. Whatever the single-stage Pokemon represent, they need to be there. They can't change. Well, again, with the Sun and Moon, I mean, the Sun and Moon games, and then also I sent you some pictures in uh, in the Discord. And look, this is the canon that we could either end life or make it... Oh, actually, you know what? Xerneas and Evoltal. Their life and death Pokemon. But anyway, it looks like a sun. It's like orange type energy when it's closed. And then when it opens, it's blue like a sphere, like the moon. And then blue energy emerges from it. What if this, combining the sun and moon or taking the sun and moon is how you get that original Pokemon that they're looking for? What if that's it? What if it kind of like Shedinja? It shed its skin, which is the moon, and then it's the sun. And they're trying to put it back together. And maybe that's what the war was over, combining the sun and moon. And these these are little pieces of it. Even echoes backwards the the sun and moon Ho 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 and Lugia, and they're both at the top of different huge towers. Mm hmm. One. And guess who else is on a tower? Arceus. What if these yeah. are the children of that original deity Pokemon? Dude. Kind of like the Dialga and Palkia to the Arceus. And then we're also, we, we also got another hint I just thought of. Uh, the fact that you combine um, the sun, legendary, or the moon with Necrozma. The original dragon, too. This original dragon from Unova. Uh, it was originally one Pokemon, and then it spread into three, which is uh, Kyurem, Reshiram, Zekrom. And then you can fuse them back together. Everything keeps mirroring this Pokemon that shed its original form into multiples and then can be put back together. It's all kind of pointing that way. Yes, and that's the way that all Pokemon were created. It's just, wow, that one's special, though. You said you were curious as to why there were some Pokemon that couldn't evolve. And just uh, a a side thought is, it sounds almost like in conjunction with the rest of what was just said, they're elements. You have this original base being, you know, Block of Gold and something like Solrock can't evolve, can't change, because it's already be a smaller piece of gold, but it is still a piece of gold. Actually, that makes me think of something else also, uh, Friendly, now that you mentioned that. In uh, Sun and Moon, there's a Pokemon called Zygarde. What Zygarde does, there's a hundred pieces of Zygarde that you put together to make the full Zygarde. What if those Soul Rocks are the same thing as Zygarde, but those are his little pieces? There's also Lunatone. Right, Those them saying the Sun, the Moon, Legendaries, like... What if those are the embodiments of the sun and the moon, the, the halves, to this original, and that that's why they don't evolve, it's because they actually go together? I'm thinking it's actually, th- those other Pokemon exist because of the fracture, kinda. It's it's like, Ar- Arceus seems to have ultimate power. It can do whatever it wants. And... Everything underneath it, it's a tiered system of, like, a hierarchy of elemental abilities. Or some uh, techniques across Pokemon generations may be similar, still being completely unique. There, there are many different kinds of fire Pokemon, but they're all a different aspect of fire. Same with water, air, earth. You'll find, you know, down, down to... Herbs, even. The jumping Pokemon, the laughing Pokemon, singing Pokemon. The the description in the Pokedex basically states their purpose on Earth hmm. to bring this one thing into existence. Well, my only question is, why can't the original dragon be reformed? Why can it only take in Zekrom, 
or Reshiram and not both at the same time become its original form. Same with Necrozma. Why can it only absorb the sun or the moon? And why, if the sun and the moon actually are legendary godlike Pokemon, why can't they go back together? What is stopping the reemergence or the uh, reassimilation of these certain beings? Something's wrong. The timeline's corrupted. You think that's what it is? The timelines? The, the timelines, and if we apply that to the matrix within a matrix thing, there's a bug in the code. There's an anomaly. And maybe that anomaly is us. We're manipulating events from outside the game. We even throw the programmers of the game into a game in each in, in a building in each generation. That's true. They didn't have to do that. They, they didn't. Pokemon and, and e- even like Nintendo devices are things in the Pokemon universe. In the first and second games, I was running across Famicoms and Super Famicoms left and right. Everybody had wow. one. I think that lends a lot of credit to what I was thinking earlier then about it being virtual worlds, possibly. Yeah, I mean, they acknowledge the existence. Uh, it's just, you know, it's like a shell game of Plato's Cave. Game <laughs> yeah. is one, and it, then it puts us in one, and we're we're already in one. So, like, it's it's a triple layer a shadow realm of watching the eternal story play out. Small thought somewhere in between on both things is uh, it all seems to kind of lend to point that for whatever reason, not all Pokemon that equate to the entirety of existence are in every timeline part section of the multiverse. And maybe I, that is why a, they can't fully recombine because they don't have all the pieces and why somebody is trying to have us collect them all. There's only one pure timeline and it would be one in which a single person has identified usefulness of each specific species of Pokemon. So that's us, basically. Yeah. Uh, they just... The only way to bring this story to a close would be to end the franchise entirely. All of this from a kid's game made in the 90s. <laughs> yes. Well, man, I had a great time talking to you about Pokemon. Hey, thank you all for tuning in. This is Grant. This is Friendly. And this is Dobby. Keep your eyes wide open. Never stop reading.